everybody. Welcome back to Addiction, Alcoholism, and the Three Principles. I am Greg Suki here with Harry Durbitsky, and today we are joined by Dr. Mark Howard. And I'm pretty excited to have him on. Um, I've, I've seen quite a few of uh, the other webinars that he's done, and always like what he has to say and how he communicates this understanding. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and let Harry do the, uh, the introduction here. Okay, I just, before I introduce Mark, I just want to talk for a second. Uh, the Golden Moments uh, course that, we, that, uh, the, that has been offered, uh, uh, we will have episode six, uh, which is Bill Pettit and Amy Johnson uh, highlighted uh, with a reading by Keith Blevins uh, from, from a quote from Sid, uh, from, from Keith's unpublished book. And then the seventh will be the wisdom of all the participants, and that will be the final episode, and we'll conclude it before Christmas. And so th th those will be out uh, uh, before Christmas, and, and it will be the end, end of the course. I've been quite pleased with it, especially the last couple of them, and uh, I'm hoping that it, it's helped a few people. Um, uh, also, my book, The Evolution of Addiction Recovery, is 80% is edited now. And in the book, uh, Mark, Mark has uh, a little bit about himself. I needed to highlight uh, top professionals who work in the field of addiction in three principles. And so it added a depth to the book that I couldn't provide for myself. And that was one of the reasons it's, it's nice to have Mark is because he's, uh, he's, he has an, um, an understanding. He came into the world of, of, of the three principles after Salt Spring, and he was, he was there all through that. And the, he, he, did, he had, um, um, I, guess you, I guess you would say, the psychologist took, took the three principles to where it is now. And Mark Howard never lost the feelings that Sid was trying to talk about. And that was highlighted the most, Mark, at the, the last uh, TCOM conference, which I felt wasn't the best conference in terms of energy. But your talk was very, very uh, substantial. It had lots of, lots of beautiful feelings. And in it, Mark talked about the addiction recovery cycle. Mm -hmm. And so I then tried to get an understanding of what that was from him. I still don't know what it is exactly, I'll be honest. But uh, anyway, uh, I look forward to that. And also, maybe you could address a little bit of where you see addiction going in terms of with the fact that in the world it's such a major issue and, uh, and sort of a little bit of how you see it, uh, the three principles helping people in that area. So with that very big introduction, <laughs> away you go. Well, thank you, Harry and Greg. Um, I'm happy to be here, and I really love it just being a conversation. Um, and I remember meeting you, Harry, uh, at one of Sid's talks, like in the 80s, and um, loved the feeling of you and, uh, and, get, and knowing you through the years and seeing you as we go to different seminars. Um, so I'd be glad to, to, you know, uh, cover some things with you, but again, I want to respect that we have conversations together today. Um, I really uh, have a lot of hope for, uh, people uh, in the world being able to find an understanding where they would transcend an addictive pattern of, of, of their lives. And, um, although it's not three principles based countries are are at least addressing the more humane aspects of it uh, i mean canada had always been a leader in harm reduction and i just saw portugal has moved it uh, as a country from a disease to a public health concern and the so they address it in more humane ways um so i have a lot of hope that um that this understanding that the principles add to um, uh, recovery uh, will will make its way internationally. I know there are a number of programs in different countries based on the principles, but 
uh, I think country-wise, there are a, num a, a number of countries moving toward a more human understanding um, uh, about the, the field of addiction. So that's my hope. Um, so um, we'll talk today, and what I, what I want to share with you in, in my talking in, about addictions and recovery and the hope that this understanding that Sid brought to us uh, brings to the field um, is that people can transcend, they can live at a level of consciousness beyond uh, what we might call an addictive um, way of, uh, of looking at life. And uh, the addiction cycle that Harry refers to was really uh, several years in, in my uh, trying to find a way to convey a, re, uh, a, a addiction and recovery from this understanding as I taught it uh, in the program that I ran for a major medical center for um, 28 years. And it just developed over years, you know, as your understanding evolves, you see more um, about how to share it with people. And uh, so this addiction cycle became a form that um, I was able to develop that Gave, some, gave people an understanding of how, uh, how we're all vulnerable to uh, look at life uh, as we grow up in a way that um, we think that something outside of ourselves gives us the, the feelings we, we come to naturally. And once we begin to look at it that way, um, we're all vulnerable to trying to keep doing that thing that we found on the outside that we think has made us feel better. And that moves to compulsive use of it or addictive use of it, whatever it can be, you know, uh, the use of alcohol or drugs or shopping or internet, whatever. If we think that that is, is, a, is what allows us to feel better, uh, we're vulnerable to keep using it. Right. Listen, that, that makes sense. And, and then, you know, people being able to understand the nature of thought brings in uh, the capacity for people to live beyond that, uh, that idea that whatever they were doing is what's making them feel better. So I started to see that early on and talk to people about it and learn from my, uh, my patients at that time, um, as they gave me feedback around how I was presenting the principles to them and, and what they were seeing. So um, do you want me to go further or are people wish, wanting to just open up their questions and thoughts? You could, I think you could, you could talk a little bit more, Mark. It's, you know, it's uh, um, um, the, uh, so, so, so the, the, you know, the, the question that, that always arises when, I, you know, when I teach this is, am I doing enough? Am I hearing? Am I, am I helping enough for, for, for them and trusting that the spiritual nature of what I'm sharing is going to help them? Uh, uh, so, uh, it, 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 with within within addiction, I always I always am uh, interested in in am I doing my best to help them? Like am I sharing what I you know the best that I have? And uh, how how do you how do you check in on yourself for something like that? Um. Well, you know, uh, I, whenever I move into helping someone, I really try to get myself into the feeling of this. I really try to live in the moment, you know, that I'm going to the office or um, uh, meeting with, with uh, people. I want to f uh, find my understanding and, um, and get into that feeling. And, and really, uh, 
just have just begin to talk with someone and share what I know today, you know, uh, because if I share what I know with someone and we have a conversation about that, we talk to one another about it, um, uh, you know, we'll see where to go with that, with what I'm sharing. I also respect uh, very deeply listening beyond my own thinking to people. So I try to get Mark Howard out of the way when I listen. And that really um, helps me because I think, you know, you and your groups or you with your individual uh, clients, um, you know, you're, you are both part of mind. Uh, you're connected to one another. And so that intelligence will guide you if um, you get out of your own way, you know. So what that means for me is, I try to just quiet down my mind about my own personal life, you know, or my own thinking about the group I'm meeting with or the, the client I'm seeing and just try to, to, to listen um, to what's going on for them, you know, um, and really know that I'll be assisted in that work. I loved uh, Sid telling us and it's on, uh, his audio tapes and so forth that, um, you know, we are being guided in life by, you know, he would say mind or God and really getting that. I mean, I didn't, don't see it at the level he does, he did, you know, but it, I see it enough that I can trust that if my listening is right when I'm with, um, with people, I'll be guided in terms of how to share this understanding. But when I start, um, I really want to get to the feeling of this um, and, um, and, you know, into the understanding that I have for it. You can only share, and it's very important to see this, I, in terms of my mentoring a number of three principles practitioners through the years, it's really important to see that if you share what you know, um, that gets across to people. It, you you, you want to just share what you see today. And uh, that's very impactful. Um, a lot of times people will hesitate, uh, particularly if they're new to the principles, it, because they, there's so much out there now um, from people that are sharing the principles and they start comparing what they know to how the how these other people teach it and they kind of start thinking man i don't know enough i gotta wait till i know enough but that's not true if you share what you have seen you are as in the same place as any any three principles teacher or practitioner because it's not the words it's the feeling you have when you share it um the words um, are just what has come to you and they're helpful you know I mean you got to talk to people but what really gets across to people is the the feeling of it and only you have the feeling of your insight into the principle so when you share that you are in the same space of consciousness that every um, three principles person that's on all these videos or whatever is so um, now, the other beauty of that is the minute you start sharing what you know and you talk with people about it, you'll see more. Um, and that's the beauty of this. And so, um, uh, so I would just, so that's how I would go about it. You can't um, think about sharing it better. You don't want to think that. You just want to share what you know in the moment. and. Um, and then talk to people about it. And then watch the feeling come out. The feeling will come out. Yeah. Um, because you'll be in it. When you share something that you've seen, you can't help but in, be in the feeling of that insight. You know, uh, Sid, Sid's, I, I don't know for you, Harry, but when, when Sid talked about that process, it's really not so much what came to your mind from the insight, it was like, what happened before that? Like what happens before that is you drop into a, a deeper level of consciousness, you know? And so when you share from that, you're in the feeling and people, people catch that. 
you know, the, the free, what Sid always said, uh, you know, listen for the feeling. It never made much sense to me until I started sharing this with people. Yeah. And the more deeply I listen, the, the more I'd get this feeling from them on more of like what that person needed to hear. And I would, exactly. I would have things that came out of my mouth that I'd never even considered before. So don't, you know, like Mark said, don't wait to share it. If you feel like sharing it, you've got, you know, not, not if you feel like sharing it because you want to try to make money off of people by coaching them. But if you feel really pushed to share this understanding to help other people, just do it. There's not really a wrong way to go about it. Just go in there with love, listen. You know, that's the most important part is listen to the person and you'll get a feeling of, of what's going on, you know, and then just go from there. It's a conversation just like we try to have here on, on these webinars, you know. Yeah, we make it a big deal. Um, I, I remember um, that in the early days uh, for me, that was around um, 1982, but we had a small group of people here in the San Francisco area that had uh, been with Sid and, and actually brought him here for seminars. And, and really, I was thrilled um, to, I was just thrilled to be able to share uh, something that I saw to be truth in helping people find um, well-being and their own uh, peace of mind. And, uh, their true nature and so but I didn't have much but it didn't matter you know on the other hand with all my training I had a ton of stuff but I just saw that's not going to do anything for people so it didn't matter that I didn't have much to share I really didn't but you know just in the course of um, of a day of, 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 of sharing with seven different people uh, it just went to and just a beautiful feeling and more came to to both me and my clients and um, that's how it evolves and the more you talk about it from what you know the more you see you keep it to yourself uh, nothing will evolve uh, Sid said that too you know he said he used kind of like um, you know, if you got a, a bottle of wine and you try to put a full bottle of wine, you try to put something in it, it won't fit. But if you empty the bottle, you can fill it up again. So he had a nice um, metaphor there for just sharing. He would tell us all the time, you know, just go share. Don't prepare. Just, you know, just, just talk from that feeling in you. And, and uh, you share your way. He said that a lot too. Um, and that's the piece here because it's so easy now with all that's out there to think you've got to share a certain way. And that's not true at all. You, you share your way because it's going to come out uniquely you. Um, it will. And you're going to have insights that will form differently than other people. And, um, and people need to hear you. The one, I listen. Oh, well, I, sorry. one of the things I want to, what you're talking, what, what came to me, what, when, this, this is when I'm in a sweat and I'm going to be talking or something. I, I noticed that when I prepared something in my head, it came out sounding technically very good, but it didn't have the same feeling that when I had nothing prepared in my head, the feeling would be much bigger and where, where I would go would be much, uh, would, would, be, would be less of me and more of, of what needed to be shared at that moment. And, and I noticed that in, in teaching the three principles it's the same thing. It, it, if anything that I have going on in my head beforehand, doesn't mean I haven't thought about it, but anything that, it, that sort of can't, which is our way that we're taught intellectually to approach things, has much less energy than, than something that is pure, pure spirit in the moment. 
And I found that to be one of the hardest things, Mark, to, to really grasp. Yeah, you know, I really, uh, I, I love the, what you shared because I think that's really the point. That's really true. And um, just, a, you know, just a way to share, the, to, to share that from me, how I see that, is um, you have to, I don't mean it this way, you know, I don't mean it like I'm, <laughs> you've got to or anything like that, but just my words for it. But you really want to believe that when you're there to share an understanding to a human being who's struggling, uh, the intelligence of, of mind will guide you. It will take care of you because that's what, the, that's what you are. And that energy will take care of you. And if you step away from your own thinking, uh, it, it will be there for you. Even uh, to the point where you don't know yet, what you, nothing's coming yet. You let people know nothing's coming yet, but let's just keep listening. Let's just keep talking to one another. And you keep yourself listening there. Now, let me just share with you an example of the talk I gave, gave at Tikkun that uh, Harry was speaking to. Usually, when I give a talk, I kind of think about it like a, at a conference. I kind of think about it a few weeks in advance, and things come to me, and I drive along, and something else comes to me, or I listen to Sid or read him. Something comes to me about what I want to say. And usually by the morning of the day I'm to present, it coalesces. Now, I don't make it coalesce, but it somehow coalesces. And this time I couldn't, it wasn't coming together. It just wasn't coming together. I had like three things I wanted to share with people, but it wasn't, I wasn't able to, it just didn't form into anything. So um, as I got into the feeling coming up to make the presentation, it just occurred to me, and that's the feeling that Harry's talking about. That's this, this spiritual energy uh, guiding. It just occurred to me, tell the people you don't have a way. It's not organized. Uh, and then it occurred to me, um, just tell them you have three things you want to share and go with it. <laughs> you know, But um, I, I just wanted to use me as how it happens to me with what Harry was sharing with all of us, you know, and the beauty of this is really you all relaxing and realizing that you are mind. And so are your clients. And so is anyone that's asking you to share your understanding and the intelligence that's there at that moment will guide it. Like Greg said, you know, things come up you hadn't even thought of. I've, that's happened. That happens all the time. So it's this beautiful uh, uh, connection we're all a part of when you're called on um, to be of service uh, to this understanding. And listening is big, you know. And again, that's a way to get yourself out of the way, your own personal thinking out of the way, and really just listen. Uh, now, so our conversation, I just want to check in with everybody, you know, and, and um, our conversation is moved away from the addiction cycle, so I'm fine with that. And I, I just wanted to see if we wanted to, if other people had something they wanted to ask or share. Yeah, Tanya about. actually has something she'd like to share. Go ahead, oh, Tanya, good. you're unmuted. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, hi, Tanya. Hi, uh, thank you actually for the segue into sort of bringing it back to addiction um, because this is the forum, um, you know, alcohol and addiction, um, three Ps based on the alcohol and addiction. Um, so I guess I just want to sort of share quickly um, my, my journey, you know, 11 years ago, I was homeless, you know, went to long-term treatment. It went through every system from family and children's services to housing, to Ontario works, to um, every resource possible in the system in order to rebuild a life after losing everything from addiction. Um, <clears throat> so I think, and then fast forward to now, my full-time job now is in at Canadian Mental Health Association uh, as a peer worker in the addictions field. So 
basically, you know, working for a huge organization, um, more clinical than than peer, but our little peer piece coming in um, is priceless in the sense that I can relate to somebody with lived, like I had the lived experience piece. I also have now a new understanding, you know, of the, of the three principles, but I guess what I guess what I'm saying is I never actually use those words, you know, in my groups when I'm doing one-on-ones. It's more of a conversation and that meeting people where they're at and that authentic, um, you know, I've been where you've been. I know where you're, what you're feeling. So I, there's two pieces. So there's that, which I think is priceless, but we do need the clinical side as well as, and when I say clinical, I guess in this form, I'm meaning people who have, you know, maybe a doctor who has that understanding who's trying to teach it, but doesn't have lived experience. We need both. So if you, if somebody is trying to share their, their knowledge, wisdom within the three P's, if they could also maybe direct them to somebody who has lived experience and we can kind of work together with that. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. It was, were you sharing or did you want to ask well, something? a bit of both. A bit of both. Okay. Okay. More, more less sharing because I'm not, I'm not, it doesn't matter if I share my story or not. I just want to give you a background of where I came from, where I'm at, uh-huh. and how I'm sharing my lived experience with addiction as well as the three principles without even naming it three principles yeah you know uh again um it it depends on to me um uh where you're what you're called on you know so if you're called on to do an educational hour with a group of people in addiction um i'm more inclined to let people know about the principles and how it operates and right. why. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I wasn't about the edge. We're our peer groups and our peer support is all about just me uh, all to get no education, just coming chatting. Maybe I'll play some Amy Johnson videos. Maybe I'll play some Michael Neal. Maybe I'll play some Sid Bank talks. Like I'll, I'll include stuff, but um, it's more, it's never educational. It's more of a sharing space. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, sure. And, um, and so, um, well, I love that you're introducing, um, you know, other teachings mm-hmm. uh, that come from uh, this understanding. Mm-hmm. Um, I think what we have to offer, uh, even, I, I mean, in our clinical work, right? Mm-hmm. What we have to offer in terms of the move into the principles is uh, people being able to gain an insight into where their experience is coming from. Can't you, do both? Can't you do that in both worlds? Clinical and peer? Oh, yeah. I yeah, mean, that's okay. Okay. I just want to underlying it. whatever way you want to go about it. Right. Anyway, mm-hmm. um, I think that's the hopeful message. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the hopeful messages of this understanding. So, Again, you know, whether it's peer or whether it's clinical or whether it's educational, um, I would only share the three principles if that really made sense to share all three principles. I rarely do that. But I do want to find a way that we have a conversation with people so they get a sense of where their experience comes from. Because, you see, if they don't get that nature of thought and consciousness uh, in your own words, not that you point to here are two principles, Mm -hmm. but they start to see that thought has something to do with the experience they're having. They're going to, um, they're going to find their own idea of where their experience is coming. You see? And so that's why this is so helpful. Right. Because it points people really to the truth of the matter. Yeah, I guess, sorry, sorry, not to cut you off, um, Dr. Howard, I think I was pointing more to um, Harry's uh, question about, you know, how does he know, you know, if he's, you know, doing the best to come across of teaching uh, the three principles to, you know, and I think I just, for me, it just triggered a sort of um, a different side of the whole thing of like, so, you know, Harry, I'm not sure if, I don't think you, you, you have lived experience with addiction or alcoholism, I, I, you've said that, so I'm not outing you. Um, but I think I was just saying another piece to all of this is, 
if we can sort of work together, like Harry maybe finding somebody that has some lived experience that can work together because that I know where you've been and I've been where you've been is priceless. And you know what I mean? Adding that into this. Well, I, uh, can I, that just, just comes through collaboration though. You, you get to know people, you know, I, I have people that send folks my way when, when they're having addiction issues, but if somebody doesn't know, because who that makes you sense, are, Greg, right? Cause you've been through it too. But if somebody doesn't know who you are, they're not going to send somebody your way. You know what I mean? It's, it's kind of, just because right. you're on a list, you know, if we if we got together a list of people who are who stay who say that they're, you know, addiction coaches or whatever, it doesn't mean that you know that's necessarily the best person to send that person to, even if they've been through it and they can relate to it. But it's it's more just about connecting with other three P practitioners and collaborating. Is Thank what you. that comes down to, you know. Well, it's. It's the same thing to me. If you're helping people, you're a practitioner, period. I, I don't care what the capacity is. I don't like, the, there's too much separation in this world. There's way too much, yeah, but you fit into this little group over here and I fit into this little group over here. No, we're, we're all in the same group. We're all human beings. And right. we're I all guess, going through all these experiences together. Guess, Some of us handle them differently, but. I guess, yes, yes. I guess qu just quickly is one more example for me is, so my son was in care for a year and a half while I got clean. Um, you know, I, when I, you know, got help and lots of therapies, lots of people to, you know, lots of treatment. When I met someone else that said, hey, I lost my child too to the, to the system and I know where you, what you're feeling and I know where you've been. I'm just saying that parallel, that, that sort of connecting with someone else as well as, you know, somebody who's just, you know, hasn't been there. I'm just sort of connecting a peer in clinical world. Like that's what we do at, at Canadian Mental Health Association. That's what right. we're trying to do. do you know and that I mean? can be true, but that's not true all the time. So it's not like a... You know, the, the principles are, no, are laws, they're principles, right. they're, they're unchanging, there's no exception to it. There's plenty sure, of people just, who get the help that, that they want without talking to somebody who's directly been through it. Right, I guess so I'm just sharing it's my It's very experience. useful, it can be, definitely. Yeah, I'm just sharing my own experience, Greg. I think that the, I think treatment for this field is open to all of those ideas, and bringing to the table uh, your, your idea of peer and the value it can, uh, it, it allows um, a connection with someone who's been through the same experience. That's the really first yeah. step is you, you really need to have the connection or the rapport. Yeah. And I think those are just ideas and ways that um, allow for people to connect with us. And um, another, another idea of peer group and people having, uh, you know, I think, I think there are people that resonate um, with um, people that helpers that uh, have gone through the same experience. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really valuable because the first place before you can share anything is having a relationship of rapport. Yeah. And if people can, you know, and if peers is a way for that to happen for a, a group of people, by all means, that's a wonderful first step. Yes. Uh, any way that people can say, oh, I'll listen to you now. Yeah. Yeah. Th that's it. And, and the more we can offer uh, about ways that people can hear, can say, okay, I'll listen to you. Yeah, that's the first step for us even being able to um, say anything about this understanding. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's why I say we need both, both. And, and I guess, and even like, you know, peer support was really founded, you know, 1935, even way before that, but you know, in AA, I mean, you know, it, you know, helping each other, like, you know, with just the whole, just because I've been where you've been. I mean, so I think, you know, just, but also acknowledging that that is a big part of um, re uh, people's recovery as well, you know, is that, that connecting with people who have been where we've been as well now the three P's has made help help me have a deeper understanding of how I work, my op, how I operate, but yeah. What what I found, Tanya, is like because I'm because I don't have a background in addiction, I don't have a background as a psychologist, I just have to trust my own instincts with yes. with regards to, to where I'm going. And I I find 
that means that I have an open mind to finding out what's on their mind because they're actually teaching me about something I don't actually know. So they touch my heart. Yes. And sometimes when I hear their war stories, I'm, I'm so affected mm -hmm. because I had no idea it was so tough. Right, which, which is you know, great, but that's not what they're coming to you for, right? Is for you to feel for them. They're coming to you for, I, you know what I mean? I'm not to dismiss that, Harry. I love you and you're great. <laughs> I'm just saying like, it's a different, um, I guess, uh, world, if you will, in terms of um, going to somebody. Anyways, I... I no, I know what you're talking yeah, about, yeah. and you're correct. Yeah. And, and that's why you're so valuable, Tanya, because you can touch somebody in a way that I can't. And, and it, not only because of my approach, but you have an understanding and a feeling that, you can, that, you can, that, that will help that person, because mm -hmm. that's where they are. Mm -hmm. that, and, and so I, I, I have found that to be fascinating to try and to have that compassion mm -hmm. for what they have. And the other part of the struggle that I, I'm just talking personal struggle here, I have is, especially initially, it was how do I share this truth that Sid uncovered in, in a way that expresses it from my own understanding and, and a way that will allow, uh, I'm going to say my personal growth to happen mm -hmm. in the area because as soon as that happens, I see more clearly. Mm -hmm. and, and as I became more comfortable with who I am, all of that kind of answered itself. But you are correct. I can only offer what I, who I am. I haven't you're, got anything. You're great, more and you helped me. You, you know, when I first, when our, our first chat. I mean, you know, you opened my eyes to some things that I hadn't maybe seen too. I mean, and again, it's all we're all in this together, and we're all helping each other, and we're all trying our best. I just wanted to make sure that we're really acknowledging that peer support work that we have and that we're doing. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I can be unmuted now, Greg. <laughs> No, I'm leaving you unmuted the whole time. I'm going to turn your camera <laughs> on, too. It. Here comes your camera. <laughs> don't even think about it. I don't know. <laughs> I, I love your point, Mark, that whatever way you're sharing this, um, is, it, it helps on so many different levels. And, and it, it does bring uh, a reason why we're all here together, like on this earth, you know, like we mentioned, my grandson helps me to understand more about love and understanding in the moment. Uh, uh, seeing, seeing clients shocked me. They were so much more fun, so much more spiritually understanding, so much uh, they, had, they had touched stuff that I, uh, I needed to feel. And, uh, and then the greatest feeling of all is if the, if the feeling lifted, I was exhilarated by the, by the, by the change. Uh, uh, and of course, I was experiencing that change live in the moment as well. And whoever was sharing, helping me in the moment. So we, we do get tremendous benefits in this area that, that are beyond in, in some ways beyond compare. And we actually have another hand up here. Uh, let's see, it looks like maybe Klesia Mendez. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name right. Hi, Greg. That was correct. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And by the way, I would like to say I was transfixed by you and your cat on the background. <laughs> so <laughs> the cat is going now. So I love the exchange of love that was going or uh, going there in the background while we were um, listening to Tanya's question. Thank you. He's a very affectionate cat for sure. I love him. He's my, he's my little buddy. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, Mike, first of all, I would like to, to thank you for putting this webinar together today. And actually, I've, I've had a few ideas for, on the back of Tanya's question. 
And really, what is my question? My question is from a perspective of, um, as, as Greg said, that we are, in, all of us, we are in this together, right? We are all part of the human family. And uh, going away with that metaphor, um, really what I'm coming from is from a perspective of a family member of uh, an, what you want to call an alcohol addicted right? Because there is, as you can imagine, uh, there is, uh, hmm, I probably I'm trying to sugarcoat it, but there is a, a lot of drama and confusion and anger because sadly, or I don't know if it's sadly or not, when a person is going through that addictive process, uh, that, that creates chaos within the family unit. Mm-hmm. And even though the person is no longer alive and is not something that I, I talk about until pretty recently, it never occurred to me that my experience could be of value to anyone else, right? Because it's not something that I talk about. Uh, uh, the word that might come to mind is almost like a shame that I, myself and the family had to go through all of that. And unfortunately, we didn't have the tools to be able to help uh, the person that that was going through that addictive uh, behavior, if you want to call it. So my question is, and that does not mean that it's something informed. I didn't have any insight about, okay, I'm going to help out people that had someone that suffered addiction in a family. It's just a question right now. Potentially could be the, the beginning of something. But how to, how to help someone possibly there that story is in the past <laughs> and now and then because we don't know what we're going to think next those memories come to the surface that in, in essence that's my question and and just a sideways um i was really um that was news for me that portugal is now seeing the addictive behavior as a public health concern because i'm originally from portugal as well so i may have a, a part to play in that as well in the future i don't know thank you So uh, can you, uh, I, I'm sorry, I just, what were you, uh, what was the question there? Um, my question really is, if you are the family member of someone yeah. that has a addictive behavior or has all had in the past, mm-hmm. how, how can you bring hope to other people in regards to that? Um, well, that's just a great question. And, uh, um, I, th- I, you know, the hope is that, uh, I mean, so as l- uh, the hope is that, um, anybody can at any time have a realization that allows them to go beyond addiction. It's all, it's always possible. But family members um, with an understanding of the nature of thought don't have to take on um, um, thinking about themselves in kind of a judgmental way or evaluative way. You know, we're all the same in that we're all um, using thought and consciousness to create a life we're living in, a reality we're living in. The person who is in an addiction process is um, their thinking is one of suffering. They're they're in some kind of insecure thinking, some form of insecure thinking, right? Um, and that understanding helps us as family members see that somebody we care about is uh, really in a a way of looking at life that. I don't know, scares them, worries them, uh, has them thinking poorly about themselves, I'm, or even worse. Um, but, um, and, and all we can do is, ha- you know, if it looks right, have an opportunity to tell somebody uh, who's a family member that there's another way to look at this. There's another way to go about life. And we can use the same understanding for ourselves to see that we can only think, we can only uh, live at the, lo- at, at the, 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 
the quality of our thinking. So we can have understanding for ourselves that sometimes we feel uh, that, you know, we feel, um, I don't know, a guilty like, you know, because we think we haven't done enough. And we can start to realize, well, you know, that's just, we just got kind of caught up in a way of thinking about this. And um, that we have the hope ourselves that uh, we can look at someone with love and understanding and even toward ourselves, that it may be difficult for us too, that uh, we can't really find a way that a family member will really hear us. But, you know, we could find ways to offer what we know and see if the person will take it. I mean, all we can sit in is love and understanding for the person. Um, and give ourselves the same understanding when uh, our own thinking varies from that. I don't know if that made sense to you. Mm. It did make sense to me in a way because I, I remember a few months that I, I had an insight. And even though I didn't have the words for it in the moment, it was like it helped give me a a different perspective, if you will, because I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense why they were behaving that way. That doesn't mean that I see it like that every single time, but in that moment that it, I just had that, oh, okay, that makes sense why they would behave in that way. If I was believing that, I would be, I would be behaving that way as well. So it, it was something that I saw a few months ago and in a way gave me a, a new sense of peace. And when you said the, the concern of that maybe I haven't done enough, oh yes, that definitely crosses my mind, which, which is ridiculous, right? <laughs> it's like, you are a kid, what can you do? Yeah. <laughs> well, I love that because I think your insight is right to the point I was making about understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, it really is, you know, realizing, uh, it isn't like intellectually getting it, but realizing that, um, that uh, there is some thinking that person is living in uh, that uh, is why they're acting the way they are. Mm -hmm. And somebody who's in, you know, a, a, a lot of addiction or just in an addictive behavior or, you know, just in addiction um, having an understanding of why they're acting the way they are really brings peace. It brings a connection to the human condition because were we in the same thinking, we may be doing, doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you really have to see that what's going on within the thinking of someone who is addicted, the addictive is really scary thinking, is really suffering thinking. And when you're in that, you want to feel better. Nobody wants to have that feeling. And so it looks to them that, I don't know, drinking or using drugs is a way for them to get out of that feeling, even if it's just temporary. But you having that insight of understanding that that's why they're doing what they're doing sets us um, to a place where we're, we're uh we don't like it, but we can have peace about it. Mm. Um, and I've seen in terms of family members, even though it may not make sense to think that you can do something about it, I think people get thinking that way and having understanding for ourselves too, um, that we may have a full range of I thoughts about how to be with someone like this and have understanding for that, that we're human too. Mm -hmm. And we could think, Oh man, maybe if only I could have done more. And to just see that that's just thinking we get into helps us. Not that, um, well, let's see, it just helps us to have understanding that we could be vulnerable to thinking that way. Mm. Um, but again, understanding the nature of thought as Sid said, even when we're in insecure thought, um, we don't escape that in life, but understanding the nature of thought helps us. So like you said, being able to come to a level of saying, oh man, that's kind of ridiculous to think that way helps us. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. It helps us. And that's um, what we can provide family members. This understanding can provide that to family members that, yeah, you may get into thinking uh, that you should have done more or you should, or you don't want to be with this person anymore. You could get into all this thinking, but just realizing that's just thought. And uh, you'll have it. You're more vulnerable as in the human condition, but you can start to see it in a way where you don't live uh, thinking judgmentally about yourself. You don't live with that thinking. You have it, but you don't live with it. Thank you. This is very helpful. Oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and I love that. I just read that recently about the shift in Portugal. So it looks like it's something recent. But to me, it's like be a beautiful way to begin to look at helping people. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have something you want to share or ask about? I just love what you're asking. It, it, it's just beautiful. Maybe I could add one more thing to what you said, uh, Mark, uh, because uh, feeling it, what you alluded to was peace of mind is the answer to an uncomfortable feeling in a situation. And what uh, it brought to mind a, uh, an image of a client that I was talking uh, to her son was go was in jail and he had a heavy alcohol problem and she was feeling extremely guilty about it mm -hmm. and I mentioned I says no spiritually it's the best thing for him and all of a sudden she realized she had been looking at it wrong mm -hmm. and the moment she saw it as a positive that it was just her perspective or her, her misinterpretation of the moment. Uh, it, it, just, it just brought relief because of course, she knew she felt tremendous love for her, her son and that's what she wanted to feel. And, well, uh, well, I think that's, this is so valuable, this particular point here, uh, because, so I, I wanna take a little time, so uh, bear with me a little bit, but, Again, you know, when, when you were listening to Sidney in person, at least for me, when he spoke spiritually, I just got a feeling for it. I couldn't understand intellectually at all. It's not about that. But I got a sense that he was, that I, something woke up in me that made sense and evolves later. But, but again, he always helped because he said, you know, it's love and understanding. And I always was curious, what's this understanding piece? And then I heard him speak about that, and it's what we were talking about. It's understanding that um, we're all the same. We're all the same using thought and consciousness to create, I'm using my words now, uh, to create the experience we're having in the moment. And so, um, and so, that, so then when we feel guilty about not doing enough for our family member, we want to have understanding for ourselves that we just got caught up in a way of thinking. Like everybody else, we were caught up in a way of thinking that um, that, that was possible, that we could you know, actually do something more than what we did. And because of that, um, we're having the effect of that thinking. And that understanding brings uh, that peace of mind that there may be another way to look at it. As Harry was sharing with this person, he shared a, a really deeply way, a deeply moving way of looking at it. And, uh, and with this woman, her son is the same way. They're, they're caught up in a level of thinking. And until they see something beyond that, they, they can't change. And that, 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 um, that change in thinking takes place at a level of insight. Some spiritual knowledge comes to, 
come to somebody's mind. Um, and I think that's really been helpful to begin to see that we're all, um, we're, we're all kind of doing this, we're all using the principle the same way. And uh, in this, and, and the vulnerability I saw in, in being with people and helping people with addictions is that we're all vulnerable to, to um, thinking about life um, in a way that we start feeling badly and then look outside of ourselves to try to, to, try to uh, feel better. And, um, and so I've seen that occur in many different ways with just things like exercise. I've seen people really um, do so much exercise in order to try to feel better from their, their um, insecure thinking that um, they, they would like um, get all uh, worked up if they couldn't do a day of, of exercise because they had in the human vulnerability thought that the exercise was giving them a better feeling. But what really goes on there, if you look at this, if you look at this, what really goes on there, even if you're drinking, even if you're using drugs, even no matter what it is that people get addicted to is that the only thing that happens in order to have a better feeling is that their thinking had to change. They had to, while they were, while they were drinking, somehow they let go of all of their insecure suffering thoughts. They had to, otherwise um, drinking would have no effect. I mean, I've had people tell me that, you know, Oh my goodness, you know, uh, I, I have to drink even more now because when I drink now, I get, I still, I still depressed. Well, because uh, somehow uh, uh, they still hold on to their painful thinking. See, that's the key. Um, and it isn't that um, uh, uh, people see that point, but that's the point I, I wanted to convey with the addiction cycle that really the only reason something we do looks like it will make us feel better is because while we do it, we're, we're thinking differently. We're thinking differently. Um, you know, so like I had a, a client who uh, over here in the, in the States, they have uh, shopping networks on TV and um, she was like, stressed out every day at work, very anxious at work. But when she came home, she would go right to uh, the TV, sit down and watch the shopping network and order something. Now, what we looked at was the minute she got into her house, she was already feeling better. Why? Well, because she, was, uh, let, she let go of all of her stressful thinking. She said, oh my goodness, I'm going to, oh yeah, now I can just sit here and I'll shop and order something. And now she's thinking completely differently. That's why that, that's why it, she continued to uh, uh, do that in an addictive way. She said that when she first came to see me, she said, you know, I can't even invite a date up to my apartment because there's boxes from the home shopping networker network all over my apartment. I have to carve ways to just get into the kitchen. I can't. Okay. So that's the suffering part of this, of being in addiction. But what she started to see was that her suffering and painful feelings were just habits of thought. She started to catch on to the nature of thought, how uh, the feelings that she was having was just coming to her from the way she was using this beautiful gift of thought. Now, once she started to see that, then she got insights. So her stressful thinking at work and her anxious feelings and all were just the way she learned to use thought. And once she got insights into it, uh, she started to live at a level of consciousness beyond addictions. 
because now she had an understanding that all that uh, all that stress was just thought. Now, it, she didn't get that intellectually. She saw it for herself. She said, oh, my goodness, Mark, what you've been telling me about all this time, I didn't realize it, but at work, I was just giving my attention to every, every negative thought that came to my head about work. I would look at it, and then I would look at the next one. No wonder I got weighed down with stress and anxiety. So that was her insight. Now, once she had that insight, then she said, oh my goodness, I, gotta, I, I, I don't want to look at every thought now. I, don't, I, just, I just can't look at every thought that comes to my mind. Now she was empowered and she was living at a higher level of consciousness, you see? So now she could live beyond her addiction. I hope that made sense to everybody because it, it really is about um, understanding the human vulnerability to think that um, like shopping uh, is what allowed her to feel better. Everyone, we're all conditioned in our lives right now to think that way. But once you have understanding that your experience and feelings are coming through you through the, through the nature of thought, that's where a cure takes place. That's, that's it. And, and so you stay with people and talk with people about it any way you can until they get their own insight into it. And that was hers. Hers was, oh my goodness, I just saw it. What you were trying to point me to was that I just saw it at work. I had a negative thought about work and then I gave that energy and then another one came along. I gave that energy and by... Uh, an hour I was like stressed to the max and I still had seven more hours of work you know and I, then we had a laugh you know we at that point of insight you can have a laugh about yourself you know so we had a laugh about it yeah you know and you didn't even give yourself a lunch break and so she saw it she was free then um, you know you when you were talking I had a, a small insight what was the state of mind when, when, when we were listening to Sydney Banks and getting something? Because, of course, um, we, a lot of times I listened to Sydney Banks and got nothing. And when you were talking, I suddenly realized he was teaching us how to let go of, of what was in my head. Mm -hmm. And putting it aside so that the spiritual energy could fill me up. Mm -hmm. And that was the only time I ever got anything out of listening to Sid. Mm -hmm. The other times it was always, I had all these blockages and it, it, and, and I'd have a few memorized phrases, but it's only when this let go mm -hmm. that I, and I actually was feeling like I was receiving rather than trying to figure out. And I, I, I can see psychologically, I spent my whole life trying to figure out what he was, what he was saying, don't do. <laughs> you know, yeah. Don't do that. Yeah. You know? and, and, and it honestly, if you're listening to the tapes or the, of Sid, it's quite a, it, there, when, he obviously can fill you up with pure truth beyond anything you've ever experienced in your life because it's just spirit. But, but only the, the teaching is to let that happen. Yeah, you know, I think that's really true. You know, that, that, to me, that's the truth of his saying, don't listen to my words. He was trying to help us not think while we were listening to him and to clear out our own mind so we could take in our own uh, knowing, our own spiritual energy. And it's the same with you sharing with people in the world of addiction. They're doing the same thing. They're, they've got tons of thinking. And it's about you gently 
uh, coming back to them as often as you need to to just share really here's the here's what i've seen here's really a piece of truth and if you can hear this it will allow you to gain your own insight and so you stay with people until they can hear something and it won't be that they hear your words it'll just be they'll take the feeling of what you're trying to convey it'll wake up in them their words like like for this client i'm telling you i didn't see that she was paying attention to every one of her thoughts. I didn't see that. Those weren't my words. My words were at the time telling her the understanding, uh, trying to help her see how thought works, helping her uh, have more understanding for herself, more uh, goodwill, less judgment. That, I was just kind of at times talking there. She's the one that saw with her insight uh, what she was doing that was keeping her from uh, finding peace of mind, you see? So, but you, you hang out with people, you keep at it, you keep at it. Because people are filled with thought, like Harry was talking about. Sid kept at it and at it and at it for years. I remember he said, I've been telling you the same thing for 30 years, you know? And it's like, you know, we get hard headed, but he's just, so, so you just help people get calmer with you, help people, and you just keep pointing them to what you've seen. Anybody else have anything they want to ask while we still have some time? Um, I said that to, for Greg to unmute me and I'd be silent, but I just have one more thing to add. To um, Kosia, I hope I'm saying that right. First of all, I'm sorry for your loss. Um, and so I have a, a brother that's homeless and addicted to heroin on the streets. I have a sister that's addicted to heroin with my two young nieces that I have to go and try and sort of, you know, see that world, only try to go in and sort of see my nieces for a quick visit and leave because I can't be part of that because I, I can't fix that. Um, you know, I work at a safe injection site. So I work uh, with heroin addicts that come in and use so we make sure they're safe so they don't die. Um, so I'm in the, you know, that I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, you know, the, the end result of addiction is death. And you've gone through it with a, a loved one. And I think we're sort of, you know, not talking about that. We're, you know, we're not talking about that. I'm not able to tell my brother when he comes in to use heroin, you know, have that, this kind of conversation. What I did do was give him $20 to buy his fix so he's not dope sick, you know. So there's different levels of where um, people with substance use are at and whatever, you know, wherever, whatever we're experiencing with our loved ones, with our work. So we have to meet everyone where they're at. And I love that Dr. Harrow talks about that too. It's like, you know, just, just be with them, just be with them wherever they're at, right? Whether it's they're shooting up still or they're, you know, wherever. Um, but we can plant seeds along the way. And my, my biggest thing for me was, especially cause I'm off drugs now, uh, is how do I keep myself safe through watching my brother homeless, addicted to heroin, my sister addicted. How do I, come home and hug my own son more tightly and love, you know, be present for my own life and not take on our, our, our loved one's uh, addiction. So I think that's the bigger piece there is like, how do you take care of yourself? And I'm sorry, I, I can't imagine, you know, I, I, I'm expecting a call every day to say my brother's dead, but it hasn't happened. So I can't imagine what you're going through. But at the same time, I think, you know, we have to sort of talk about that too you know it's like how do we deal with that level of addiction um so i thank you for sharing Kosia, and uh yeah that's it well uh again you know um i, I mean there's so so much more we could say about what you've been presenting both of you have been presenting and i think that if you can I think that uh, again you know that that's kind of the harm reduction model that i think is treating people humanely. Uh, now, the other thing is, look, there's two things here. And uh, really, I mean, I'm just trying to be brief because of our time, but there's so much more to say. Um, if you know uh, what you have uh, been able to just get a glimpse of, um, and you're 
uh, working with people at that level of addiction, I think you could plant seeds. I think you could say, um, because I've done it. I think you could say, hey, yes. you know, here you are. We're going to work with and give you the injection or we're going to give you methadone. Now, if, you'd ever, if you're ever curious about something that's really been helpful to me, sure. I'd love that's to share it. Yeah. Yeah. So you see, you've got, you're a vehicle because of the insight you have found. And you never know who will show up and ask for that. But, sure. yeah. but anyhow, and, and taking care of ourselves in the midst of that is just another whole new topic we can talk to. But just, just see the, you, and, and the other piece is you showing up, um, with whatever understanding you have, people notice. People notice. Um, I mean, I showed up with this understanding that changed me. And I showed up in a clinic with um, 30 other mental health professionals in a different way. I didn't really see myself that differently, although I knew I was coming in with more understanding. And a few months later, uh, a couple of mental health professionals came up and said, we want to know what you learned because you're a different person. So people will, people will, um, people will know, will see you uh, as you, as you live more with your understanding. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like the planting seeds. That's all we can. I know I can't fix anybody. I know it's not, it's not my job. Um, planting seeds has been a big sort of, you know, I just keep reminding myself, just plant the seed, plant the seed. And just that's it. That's it. Along the way. Too. Yeah. yeah yes. That's all it is. That's it. That's all it is. It's just, it's just, and coming from the, for me, it was like the thrill of that, that I really had something mm -hmm. that really could help you. I mm -hmm. really saw that. I finally had something that mm -hmm. could be of help. And so, you, you know, you plant that seed, you plant that seed. That's the job, you know, as well as, yeah. as uh, you know, helping people um, just make sure they're safe and not, yeah. uh, and having a clean needle and whatever. Yeah. But, but now you have something that you could say, hey, if you're ever interested, yes. uh, I got something that really helped me. Yeah. That happens in the chill space. It's called our chill space. So I hang out in the chill space when they're on the nod and I just be like, Hey guys, have you heard of this? You know, have you heard of this? But anyways, that's another story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think one of the teachings that, that probably Mark knows really well is, is, is you, can, you can't live your life just on results. The, the the immediate results you it has nothing to do with the spiritual journey we're on where you're planting the seeds and the spirit takes care of the rest so the person uh two years later or three years later has an insight that you contributed something to that helped them um but if 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 you're going to live your life on just immediate results, it's kind of like a businessman. He is only happy if he, if he makes money. Uh, it, it, the job gets much too difficult because you suffer personally so much. Mm -hmm. And so you have to go deeper inside yourself to a spiritual place where you see that it's a spiritual journey. And as Mark mentioned, you feel so blessed that you can actually plant a few seeds and help a little bit because in the end we're good people who want to help other good people and uh, so I, I can't feel very good Tanya as a human being if I don't feel like I'm helping in some way but I can't be attached to the results because immediately I'm going to get I'm going to drown in that and uh, feel free to uh, be optimistic about what I'm doing. And, by the way, having fun <laughs> helps a lot, too. You know, I really like to have fun. And I can't feel fun if I feel disappointed about what I'm doing. Beautiful, guys. I think that's a great place to wrap it up here today. 
uh, thank you so much for joining us, Mark. I, I think it's been a really, really good conversation here with a lot of great, uh, great topics coming up. A lot of good conversation, like I said. Uh, thanks to Ecclesia and Tanya for participating. This was, this was really something special. Did you have anything to say in closing, Mark? Well, I just love being here, and um, uh, I, I hope um, our conversation uh, was helpful. And, you know, um, if there's ever room to come back, I mean, there's some of what was raised we could have another conversation about for sure, you know. But I just, uh, I, I love being able to be with all of you. And, um, uh, you know, um, it, was, it was just a really good time. And I, I think the, only other, the other, only other piece is that you just, you know, Sid, what um, Harry said just reminded me of something I just want to close with. Sid said, you know, when someone speaks truth, uh, every soul hears it. And so um, when you speak from what you've seen to people, they hear it. It may not look like it at first, but if you stay with it, um, uh, people will wake up to it. And well, thank so you so much for you. having me having me here. I really, I really appreciate it. Yeah, let's see. Let's see about uh, scheduling you in, in a couple months here to come back on and finish up. I know we're scheduled ahead a couple months, so yeah, definitely, we'd love to have you back on and continue the conversation. Yeah, that would so, be wonderful. So definitely All appreciate right. you, Mark. I'm well, going to go ahead and unmute so everybody so people can say thanks and goodbye and everything. And everybody enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs> All right, everybody. Okay, thank All you. Right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.